<laughs> no, no, no. I wear yellow too. It's part of the party's color. <laughs> yeah. Don't get so touchy. Don't get so touchy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for attending this press conference. Um, GPL continues to give us headaches, and um, we're very much aware, as I said last week, about the problems it's causing to many people in this country. Um, we have been inundated with complaints, and people's lives, people's lives are being disruptive, disrupted because of the situation. So we understand this from a policymaker's perspective. The president has put together a group of ministers, and I'm part of that group where we're on a daily basis looking at what is happening in GPL to ensure that all of the equipment, last week we dealt with the equipment, their age, and why we're in this situation now, given the lack of investment by APNU. This week I don't want to address that again. The reality is that a lot of the, the equipment that should have been in reserves are still being used now, old equipment. Um, they would have gone in reserves had a miler been built. But we have to keep using them until the new power plant comes on stream. So we are focusing heavily on ensuring that the current capacity we have is maximized that involves bringing into production some of the units that were bought and are still um, not in, have not been brought online, and fixing some of the other equipment that have developed problems. So they told me that hopefully by Saturday that they should be able to get most of the equipment or some of these equipment up and running again that will um, allow us to have capacity that maximizes the peak demand. Now, I'm going based on what GPL is saying because I don't like to put my neck on the block for GPL. Um, I don't want to disappoint people, but this is what we're told, and they're working in earnest to get that done. Simultaneously, a group of ministers, including the Attorney General, the Minister of Finance, Minister Indar, and others, are working with a proposal that we have. Today, we are meeting with the, the um, company to supply emergency power. Hopefully, before the end of the week, we can conclude this contract and have this vessel arrive in the country maybe two to three weeks later that will see a significant injection of power into the grid in addition to what we have. So this will be, um, we're we intend to contract this for two years. Um, until the gas to energy project is completed. So we're, we're hoping that within a matter of weeks, we'll be able to bring the situation back to normalcy and then have extra capacity to address any failure of equipment like we have experienced recently. Now, having said that, many people have expressed the worry that our solution 
which this government has been working on to address this power situation definitively and in the long run so that we have stable power way into our future. We do not experience power outages of the type that we have seen and to address not just reliability of power but the cost of power. They, they have read a Reuters article which casts some doubts on the timeline for the completion of that project. Now let me say that this is a complex project that we have put together to solve our problem definitively. For too long in our history, we have not done this. We thought we had the solution with Amila. Amila was killed. And now, returning to office, we set about putting together this project. So I want to take you through the component parts of this project so that you understand what we have been saying and what has been in the public domain, but I think people often forget. So the project has several components. I can think about five components to this project. The first is the pipeline. The second is the building of the power plant and the gas and the, the NGL facility. The third is the transmission main to move the power to the control center. The fourth component is the control center. And the fifth component is an upgrade of the transmission and distribution system. So five separate components that will make this project a major project that will solve our electricity needs for long into the future, prepare us for an industrial era and for a modern era for supply of power. It is recognized that the, the transmission system, which has seen very little in investment, is too old to handle even increase if you increase generation and make generation reliable. But with a failing transmission system, you can take the power around, you would have many outages. So you have to look at the project in totality. And that is when, when we sat down and planned this project, we started from scratch. We said, what is the cheapest form of fuel? And the cheapest form of fuel is the gas. Water would have been cheaper had we gone the hydro route. Water would have been cheaper. But in this case, it's the cheapest form of fuel. That's a one. Two, that using gas would cut our emissions from the current level by 50% because gas is cleaner than bunker C. So we settled on the fuel. Secondly, we said, what would be the location? We examined several locations. We examined Burbies, we examined Wales, and the East Bank location. We look at the feasibility. The Wales location turned out to be the most feasible location, given not just the power plant, but the need for industrial development using the gas. We had a large amount of land there. Had we gone to the Palmyra area, because it's swampy, etc., because the pipeline, the length of the pipeline from the FPSO, Liza to Burbies, is the same from about Burby, from the, the FPSO to Burbies, Palmyra area, as it is to the West Coast. But in th those conditions there are more swampy conditions, cause more pro problems, etc. It was found that this was the most feasible location with adequate land for subsequent industrial development, um, fertilizer plants, a whole range of other 
other facilities utilizing the, the gas that will come there beyond this project because the pipeline is sized to bring in more gas beyond the 50 million cubic per day that we'll use for this project. So we looked at that and we looked at the numbers. We said, what will it cost us to generate power here? At the, if you include the price of gas, it will probably be maybe about six to seven cents. But gas is free. So what will it take for us to pay back for this whole project? The pipeline, the, gas, the NGL facility, etc. What will it cost us cents per kilowatt hour? It came out to about four US cents per kilowatt hour. Considering now we are generating power at over 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Four cents per kilowatt hour, so it costs. So the project numbers to pay back the pipeline, even at a billion dollars for the pipeline, and 759 million dollars for this power plant. You can pay it back, and still it will cost you four cents per kilowatt hour. So the savings to the country and to the people of this country will be at a mini, minimum 100 million US per year. At 100 million US. So the numbers came out well. So we planned the project. So the first part was setting aside a fund for the pipeline. A billion dollars was set aside for the pipeline, but that included the upgrade of the roads to get to the site. It included the um, uh, material offloading facility. It included a site preparation for 100 acres, and it included a laydown yard. All of these were part of the one billion project and the pipeline. This was all managed by Exxon. So the second, the second component was the power plant itself and the NGL facility. We went to tender and Linseca and CH4 won the tender for 759 million dollars. Now, what were the components of this? So, in this case, the timeline first of all. The timeline was that by end 2024, listen carefully, end 2024, as per contract, Linseca and the others were supposed to deliver 200 and 28 megawatts of power. Four turbines were to come on stream at the end of 2024 of 57 megawatts each. To complete the project in the agreement where the full 300 megawatts would come online, they had, that is the, the combined cycle, that is the two additional turbines, these were the steam turbines, the four gas turbines were supposed to come on stream in 2024, and the steam turbines should have come on stream in 2025. So the completed project as per contract is in 2025. That is the completed project. Now, Exxon, so that was the agreement. Because I see people say now, the, the end of the project has not shifted. What we have now is a delay for the four turbines, the single cycle turbines, right? This, or the simple cycle turbines, these to come and the delay we believe is by three months. So taking it to end March, April, and the, the contractor wants a delay 
or to complete the single the simple cycle um, turbines, the gas turbines, by August. But the total project timeline has not shifted. That is to bring the 300 megawatts fully on board. That's in 2025. So why did this happen? So as I said before, Exxon was responsible for <clears throat> the site preparation, the road, the MOF, that's the material offloading facility, and the laid on yard. We were supposed to hand over the site to the contractor by June. We did not hand over the site that is, Exxon did not hand over the site until September. And it was still incomplete, and they handed over an additional 14 from the 1 billion that is set aside to the contractor to complete the site. So a three months delay. Who was the, local, the contractor that Exxon had? It was Gisby to prepare the site. So we had a three months delay by Gisby and Exxon to hand over the site to the contractor. For which we have now decided that we will give them an extension of three months. That is from end 2024, an additional three months. That is why we are arguing that the plant must be completed by March, well, end March, April of 2025, instead of end December 2024. The second thing is that GEICO was supposed to do the, the MOF, the Material Offloading Facility, and the, in, hand this over by July with Exxon to the contractor. This was done till October, and they still have some issues with that. So that is where the three months, we're arguing that three months delay on the project came. They want a, a longer period because the liquidating damages for not completing the project on time for the contractor, if they don't complete the project on time, it's over 11 million US per month. They have to pay in liquidating damages for delay on the project. So they're arguing that they need more time beyond the three months. We are saying three months adequate for you because that is the, the delay we've had. But remember, that is only to bring the 228 megawatts on board. The 300 megawatts timeline, the full 300 megawatts with the, with the steam turbine still on track to end for end 2025. So the contractor now has made a claim for money now. They want additional money because they are saying this is costing them. So our independent engineer supervision firm, a firm that we hired from India called IEL, that is independent, they are the big design supervision firm, has reviewed the claim and rejected it totally to say it doesn't have merit. Or they, they, or we have legal opinion to say that they have no merit on the financial claim. Now, when you were faced with that sort of situation, as with any contract, you now have to go to a dispute resolution mechanism. So what was chosen was something called a Dispute Adjudication and Arbitration Board. And so the matter is likely to be determined by three persons from that board who, which is currently being set up. Now, when they determine this matter, if at the end of the process, either party is not satisfied with the, with the result of it, they can then ask for arbitration. So that is 
the full picture of what you have heard. So this is, I've seen all sorts of fiction about when this project is coming on stream, etc. Now let's go back to the pipeline component. The pipeline component, at some stage, this will have to be connected to the FPSOs. So the article estimates that we lose about 12 million barrels of oil in the period. The two weeks, they, we, they have one month in the article. We, our estimate with Exxon given this to us is two weeks. So each of these FPSOs would have to be shut down for two weeks to connect the pipeline to, to the FPSOs to simplify. Now, we will have deferred production because we will not be producing in this period. This was taken into account in our forecast for the revenue for this year. It's not a billion dollars of loss. loss. We estimate about six to seven million barrels of deferred production but they're hoping to, to bring forward maintenance for that period on the FPSOs, for the period when they have to shut them down to kind of make the connection. But you can't, you can't not shut them down and make the connection. So this was considered right from the beginning. This is not a new variable. This is something that was always contemplated it's part of the project. You have to connect at some stage. So it contemplated uh, shutting down these, connecting, and then restarting production. And that's normal. So they will complete the project, their pipeline, right up to the site by the end of the year. So what will happen? They, it, they will test the pipeline and then probably pressurize it, nitrogen, and, and seal it, because it will be a different, the power plant will come on stream a few months thereafter. The third component of the project is a contract was given to Kalapatura, I think it was, the Indian firm, for $159 million to build about a, a 85 kilometers of transmission main to evacuate the power. So you have the power now, the pipeline is connected, the power plant is, is there, the NGL facility is operating, so you need to move the power. So this project is to build three substations and 85 kilometers of transmission main and will be completed by the end of the year. So that will take some of the power back to Vredenhoek to be used on the west coast and most of the power will come to Eccles Good for Wachtin, where we are now building the fourth component of the project which is a control center which will cost us about 25 million in the short run and maybe about 50 million when it gets more sophisticated. So that will, they, that facility, the, the transmission, can then come to the control center for dispatch around the, the country. So those, the, the, if you look at it, we are, the contract has been awarded already for, um, for the the equipping of the control center, I think for about eight million US dollars, and then they're building the building at the back of Eccles now, good for Watkin Eccles, right down at the back there, a massive area now for the control center, where we can remotely then dispatch power through the whole country, see if you have blackouts in that control center. You don't need to go on the road to check if you have blackouts, etc. It's a modern control center for the dispatch of power. So that's a fourth comp the, these components of the project, third and fourth. 
big, pro big elements. And then the fifth one is we have to upgrade now a number of feeders around the country. New transformers, replacing old lines, etc. So you can accommodate the new larger volumes of power. This will cost, through multiple projects, about 40 projects we have, small projects, will cost about $185 million. And that is going to be done mainly by GPL. And then we are looking at another component of the project, which will be about building, as part of moving power, a 100 million transmission line from Georgetown all the way to Linden with substation. So we can take this power to Linden. So we can have now, you know, we buy power very expensive at Bosai now, and then we supply it cheaply to the community. So we can cut those costs from and supply Linden from this power plant here. And we build substations along the way so you can then take power up to the highway or entire along the highway so when the Silica City comes on stream, people would have power. We can distribute power there. These are the five components that we are working on. It's a complex thing. And they all have to be, they would finish at different times, but it's a major undertaking to modernize an entire grid. So when I see this kind of graph all the time from the opposition and they don't know what they're talking about, and we have explained this a million times, it's not our fault that people are not listening or putting it together in the various components. So they're, they're getting all hot under the collar over the Reuters article, but it doesn't mean much. This delay was anticipated, contemplated before, and, and this arbitration, it has a real reason because Exxon and Gisby handed over the site three months later than they should have, should have handed it over, and the same thing with Geico. They didn't do the work. And so this is what's happening on that project. So I hope that you have a clear picture of <coughs> all the component parts of this project. The second, second thing that I wanted to talk about today was a headline from the Kaicho News. And it is a very dangerous headline because banking systems operate on confidence. And when you have a headline of the nature of the one that they had recently, it can undermine confidence in the banking system. In other countries, this has caused grave consequences for people. So the headline says, President Ali's intervention caused New Building Society to lose half a billion in profits, chairman <coughs> of the New Building Society. And then a sub headline says, non-performing loans, now a problem, will extend to other financial operators. So the first thing that you need to understand is that the NBS is a mortgage loan organization, and it was set up under Chapter 3621 to provide, um, this is our law, to provide affordable mortgages to people. So their, their entire existence is to provo provide affordable mortgages to people not necessarily a profit-making venture. As a result of which, 
they are, because of their peculiar nature, they enjoy a lot of preferences from the state, tax concessions, etc., that other commercial banks do not enjoy. And this is historically so. So, Kaichur News looked at the 800 to $850 million that was given back to the 14,000 people who now have mortgages at NBS and plus is available in the future, the benefit would be available to those who are taking out mortgages, and claims that NBS lost this money because President Ali made an intervention to ask NBS to reduce interest rates for them. President Ali, first of all, did not direct NBS to, to reduce the interest rates. But given what's happening in the economy, President Ali has been urging all of the institutions, all of the institutions to ensure that people can afford mortgages. This is a benefit to people in our country to follow this, this road of reducing mortgage rates. Now let me make it clear where we are today. When we took office in the 90s, a mortgage rate on a loan was ranging between 37% to 40%. That's the interest rate. If you go back in that period, you will see it was impossible to borrow. If you took a loan of a million dollars, in two and a half years, the loan, if you didn't pay back anything, it became $2 million if you capitalize interest because the interest was 40%. This was, this was the situation. So people could not borrow to build. What, the result of this was we did not build houses since Burnham died. You didn't, nothing happened. People did not own homes, etc. So the PPP, when they got into office, we started. First of all, because we fixed the macro economy. So we, we have a stable macro economy. We tame inflation rate. We stabilized the exchange rate. Interest rates started coming down across the board for not just com mortgages, but commercial loans. Then we also met with the banks and we offered them some special preferences. We said, if you make loans available to people who borrow up to 40,000 US dollars, or when I was president, you will not pay the 45% corporate tax at that time. Be, um, on income arising from those loans. Therefore, you should then ensure that the taxes that you don't have to pay go towards reducing interest rates, and the interest rates plummeted for low-income homes. We have done, I don't want to repeat, but we have done a number of things. We have had people come in We've de-risked a lot of the, the borrowing by allocating land and pledging the land to the banking institution so that people who did not have collateral could then go and still secure a loan. And because of that, tens of thousands of people started owning homes in this country. People must not forget that because we, we used to send a letter of assignment over to the bank, we sat with the bank, we worked through with them, we said, in case there is a default, you, know, you have a collateral, which is the land and the, and, and the house. Because if a person had just gone into the bank before the, 
they um, got the land or the home, they wouldn't have been able to secure the loan. I'm not going to go through because today is not for that purpose, but I can chronicle all of the changes historically we made so that interest rates today, if you look at the interest rates at NBS on low income <coughs> homes, mortgages, it's lower than in the United States of America currently. People can borrow at a cheaper rate in Guyana than on these low income mortgages at NBS than they can borrow in the United States of America now. In when we were 40%, the US was 3% and 4% in the past. And now we are, th you can borrow cheaper now in Guyana than in the United States of America. People should be proud of this. Instead, we get criticized for it. President Ali causes NBS to lose half of its profit. Because NBS profit this year come, came down to $680 million from about $800 million in previous years. But by reducing the interest rates to 14,000 of their borrowers, they have, those borrowers have saved another $800 million. So when you add the six, 650 to 680 to the 800 million, you really see the performance of NBS. That's a spectacular performance, but they've chosen to give back to their people, their members who are borrowing from the institution. So Guyanese, through the NBS alone, the 14,000 have saved over 800 million in reduced payments on their mortgages. That is a success story. That should be applauded. And then they said, oh, President Ali caused it to lose half a billion in profits. If you're looking at, don't look at NBS alone. Look at all of the banking institutions and you will see a similar situation where mortgage rates have come down on every banking institution because of the stability in the system and because we've been urging the banks to lower mortgage interest because we want people to own homes. So we are supplying more house lots now as part of our manifesto promise and we are working to ensure that mortgages become affordable. You have to do both at the same time if you want to get an increase in housing stock and home ownership. APNU doesn't want that because they, they want to help you rent. That is what Norton said. He would help people to rent homes if they were to win elections. So look at this. Now, now what is um, how much money in the total system? In 2020, you had $82 billion, $82.7 billion in mortgages for private dwelling. Now, in this year, it's $108 billion, $108.6 billion in mortgages for private dwelling. It has grown by 20-something, 20 $26 billion, a growth in mortgages that people have borrowed for housing purposes. So people are borrowing more because there's lower interest rate too and greater stability. So the other point, so, so that's just about new building society and who, who is benefiting from lower interest rates. But the dangerous part of this article is the non-performing loans now a problem will extend to other financial operators. So if imagine you're saying that the whole banking system now is in trouble with non-performing loans. And if you have non-performing loans, and it's of this magnitude that it could affect the stability of the banking system because you, the banks are not getting an income from the non-performing loan, then maybe people should worry about the safety of our banking system. 
Well, we have stress tests more than most countries our banking system. We have the top, one of the toughest money, anti-money laundering law anywhere in the world. In fact, we've gone overboard. It's so hard for people in this country to set up a bank account. You know when you go there, people want all sorts of things that they wouldn't even demand in the United States of America. Proof of address a hundred times and all of that nonsense. So we have a stable banking system, but this, are, this headline was taken out of the blue just like that. And it is a lie. It's factually incorrect. Let me give you the reason. So in 2019, non-performing loans in the banking system was 12.1%. Do you know what it is this, this year? It's 2.7. That meant that the non-performing loans in the banking system as a whole was 12%. That was people not paying back on these loans. Now it's 2.7%. That is across the banking system. So contrary to what they have there, it's a lie, total lie, that, that, they, that it will affect other operators, financial operators and banks. And secondly, New Building Society itself has reduced their non-performing loan from the COVID period from about 10% to about 3%. When you mess with the financial data like this, it's, they, one wonders if this is journalism or this is like just conjecture. And this is a daily occurrence with Kaicho News. No regard for fact, no regard for the damage that they can do to the financial system. Glib headlines, sensational headlines, just to, to exaggerate and to make everything look bad. So President Ali is the fall guy now. He should be proud as Minister of Housing he did a wonderful job, and he continues to do this, uh, to, to, to do the same thing as president, in this sector particularly. And so, this is very, very dangerous, and that's why I, I had to address this matter. Now, there, since I'm at it, let me talk about the same headlines. Because we are going to continue to suffer in the future from these false headlines. But it's the people out there. Because a lot of them watch these, these press conferences. And we need to sometimes point out that what are the point I just made, that this newspaper has ceased to be a credible news organization, that it's now the political arm of an individual. So last week I explained, and I played a tape here, where Coretta McDonald said that India bought some aircrafts from another place. India, not from an Indian company. India bought it from somewhere and then resold it to the government of Guyana at $30 million. And this is a massive corruption. Massive corruption by the government of Guyana. That's it for her. Patterson was on the same program and Patterson said, no, it's not, it's not 30, it's $28 million, the two aircraft, okay? So I pointed out that the two aircraft cost us $16 million and $8 million each and the rest was spares and training and transportation, etc. So Kaichur News left here 
and they went back and they published an article. Guyana borrowed to buy two airplanes for the price of four. Two airplanes. So they said they had an excerpt, right, from the Economic Times, and this was it, that the Indian government bought for the army from this Indian company six of these aircraft at 667 crore, which is an Indian denomination crore. And if you convert the 667 crore, it works out to $30 million. And then they divided the the 30 million, 31 million by, by six and said, we could have gotten four aircraft. Now, it, I think they were hoping to justify because they went back and justify what, what um, Coretta McDonald and Patterson were saying. But don't you have any pride don't you have any pride? If you go online and just use a currency converter, anybody can use it, a child can use it, and you input this 667 crore, you will see that it comes out to a US dollar value of 80 million, not 31 million, which dunce in the Kaichor news can, can't use a converter, and it's a headline. Borrowed two, to buy two airplanes for the price of four. So there's a, you can't say anything else, but this is a dunce because you can just go online and convert it. Now people can make mistakes. Coretta makes these mistakes all the time, and, and Patterson, because they're politicians, and, and if it was a man's, I could understand. A man's on holder. They got a, a proclivity to doing this all the time. But it's a newspaper, for Christ's sake. Can't you just use a currency converter? Because if you take now 80 million, that is what the Indian government paid for the six aircraft, and you divide by six, you're actually getting 13.3 million per aircraft. So we bought the aircraft for 8 million, so we picked the Indian government pocket, right? So we get it cheaper by half than what the Indian government paid. But you understand, we bought the basic version and they bought an upgraded version. That's the difference. But they paid 13.3 million US and we paid 8 million for the same aircraft. But they said, the headline, Ghana borrowed to buy two airplanes for the price of four. You can't even use numbers. So the thing is that you recall a couple of weeks ago, the same newspaper, they could have built a hotel for the price that we paid to, to house the trainees in Essequibo, $75 million, a bold headline. Government pays $75 million for for accommodating the trainees on the executable course. You could build a hotel for this. And what happened? The actual number was less than a quarter of that figure. Less than a quarter of that figure. But they never, they never changed the headline. They never changed the headline. It was a lie, downright lie. But it, the damage is already done because it's a headline in the newspaper. People follow on the basis of headlines. You recall that this was the same Glenn Lal on a program with me. He said he could build one of the hospitals we are building for $10 million. Well, I've never seen him bid to build a, 
a hospital for 10 million. In, the, in other parts of the world, the state of the art hospital, the 10 million is more for the equipment alone. But he could build it for $10 million. Big, bold headline. They could build it for $10 million, what we're spending $30 million for and, and all of this. You recall, he could supply power for 3 cents per kilowatt hour. Up to now, hiding. A year has passed. I said, we'll buy it from them. He's hiding there. The lies accumulate. You recall. Again, the Marriott. A couple a year ago, he said, came right here and said, I own up to now the Marriott. I said, if you could prove that, I'll resign. No apology so far. That's not true. Um, this is this is it. You recall the the Jack they own EasyJet. I own an airline. Headline again in the past. Not true, no apology, nothing. You rem remember the Hope, Hope Canal, oppose it, it will run dry, the farmers are opposed to it. Thing. Remember the airport, that it was a corrupt PPP project and it turned a blind eye to where all the corruption happened on the app, when I explained that before. Opposed to the Amilas Fall, headlines again, the place would run dry, etc. Everything, this is what we're faced with. Every week, now it's ring fencing all day, and we're selling out the country, ring fencing and all kinds of nonsense. So, I want to caution people, when they read the headlines, they gotta know that this, that it's not based on journalism. This is based on fiction, lies, and this is part of repeating the, the PNC, APNU, AFC propaganda, and they have sucked up once again to, to Glen Lal and, and they share the same objectives. So, please, when you read these sensational headlines, oh, then understand where it's, it's coming from. Now, In the last week, we have seen um, the reemergence of Moses Nagamutu. And um, to the launch of a book, Dear Land of Guyana. And there are mixed reviews of the book. So in the, I didn't read the book, I must confess. So I am utilizing two sets of articles to fashion my comments. One in the Kaichou New, the Starbuck News, and from Ken Freddy Kisun. His, his letters, because he seemed to have read the book. So in the Kaicho, in the Starbuck News, it says the book is his reflection of experiences he wants to share. It is my truth. And that is the most truthful part of the book. It is his truth. Now his truth, given the history of this country, has been known to generously depart from the objective truth. If you know Nagamoto. If you read Bill Carr's son, his Machu Carr, his book, you will, you should read it and you will see that He spoke of um, Nagamutu and the biblical tales that he told him. But one of these was he was on his way to fight in Vietnam. 
and he got as far as Mongolia. And then he was rejected. And the reason is that Vietnam was not accepting volunteers from Guyana because we're too small a country. So it was a tall tale. And he often tells these tales, and he, uh, over time, he's, he's done so, so often that he actually starts believing these things. You recall Chedi Jagan whispering to him in the high mountains of the Rupununi that he would be the next leader of the PPP. So only he, he heard it. So when Chedi Jagan departed, he did not, um, he did not, he propagated that myth, but most people who knew him in the party at that time knew it as a fiction, fabrication. So I treat this as a work of fiction. This is fiction. So <clears throat> let me go through a few things. He said, this is the Starbuck News. He said it was an inexplicable display of incivility and recklessness where the former prime minister was stripped of personal security protection and all state transportation facilities. He and his wife were literally told to walk home. He said that when people arrive at a situation in a country where the rules, respect for national symbols, respect for leaders and elders are not observed, people lose their values, self-respect, and they degrade the society. Lofty, wonderful ideas. <clears throat> Prime Minister Samuel Hines wrote a letter. And Sam, knowing his style, he didn't want to speak about what took place in that period. So he hinted at it, read the letter in the Chronicle. And he said, basically, that I agree with Moses, but his experience was different. When the government changed in 2015, he had to walk through with Nagamutu's family to hand over the, the residence. And then when he showed up at the gate to collect some of the things, couldn't enter again. They told him, you can't come in here again. Nagamutu and the others couldn't come up, couldn't go in. He talked about vehicles being taken away. Sam had to catch a vehicle to go downtown. Read about, read about the letter. Taken away. I asked Donald Ramatar about the vehicles that he had. And when his vehicle went down, the land cruiser that he had, for one year they sent him a 19, no, a 2004 rum. You know the rum? As former president. So one day I'm at Freedom House and they, I think my vehicle had gone to drop somebody. And I asked Ramatar for a drop to somewhere else. I just popping over somewhere. And I went in this vehicle. First time I saw a vehicle like, close like a minibus like that. And he had it for a year as a former president. As a former president. I didn't allow them. I had my own vehicle. So when they took their vehicles, I bought another vehicle and I also used my vehicle because I had another Land Cruiser. So I didn't ask them for anything or anything of this sort. You recall how they kept the utility payment for $25,000 trying to humiliate us. They stopped paying 
for the utility bills, which every president in from, from, from Arthur Chung all the way up, we pay their utilities, full utilities, but they capped the ex-president, myself, Amitar, and Sam. Capped it at $25 a month. They didn't stop paying mine. I didn't bother. After the government changed, I went to court. I won the case. I got my money back. So I didn't even bother to call them. They wanted us to beg. And I wasn't going to beg APNU for anything of that sort to, to, to return the utility payments, etc. Contrast how they, they cap the medical benefits for ex-presidents at $200,000 a year. Now, Granger is the first person to re retire from office. Now we pay all of his medical benefits. It runs into millions of dollars per year. We, didn't, we ignored a law that he passed, that they, they passed, the coalition government. And people like Nagamutu and Ramjatan were cheerleaders in parliament for doing the same thing. They were cheerleaders. You look at them in parliament. He talks about 50-50. They used to say majority is majority. Now they're talking about 50-50, etc. Majority is majority. But they were cheerleaders for those, those bills. In fact, Nagamutu, throughout the campaign, lied, he and Ramjatan, saying that they inflated the figure of how much my benefits were inflated it and made it seem that these benefits were unique to me and not for all former presidents. But they were for all former presidents, including Samuel Hines, who served seven months, and me, who served 12 years, and we get the exact same benefits. But they made it look like I took this for myself. Show the campaign. They lied about it, and then they were cheerleaders to pass the law capping the benefits for exit. And he talks about dignity, about dignity today, how we must treat our former leaders with dignity. Let me, so you didn't see Granger or Nagamutu at Soku. So Ramatar had to go to Soku, a former president. Samuel Hines went to, to Soku, a former president. I had to go to Soku. Um, Irfan Ali went to Soku, a future president. Luncheon was taken from a wheelchair, arrested in my office, because we asked them to take the statement right there. Yeah, they had to fetch him in a wheelchair to go to Soku. Anil Nandalal, Irfan Ashni Singh, Priya Manikchan, Nigel Jarana, almost every member of the cabinet had to go to Soku. And he talks about dignity now, how treating people and former leaders in a dignified way. So he's either delusional or convenient or both, and he actually be believes that he's a victim of something. There were cheerleaders for this. I remember Ramjatan celebrating with Settlington after we were taken to Soku. Celebrating. So, a lot of this the vindictive nature, they were running down everybody. You remember the forensic audits? They called in some of the cronies, especially people like, like Christopher Ram and Gulsaran, and they gave them, contrary to the law, they did 45 forensic audits that were, they were supposed to jail us with. 45 forensic audits in every agency. And then they couldn't find all this corruption that they were talking about in their forensic audits. If we wanted to be vindictive in the office of the president alone, you had four or five staff who got 3,500 acres of land assigned to them. So, so <clears throat> they're, not, they're not in jail now. 
So, so a lot of this, you, you recall the Jubilee, when we had the Jubilee celebrations and we, as members of parliament and the opposition, we were invited to go. So I said to the members of parliament, we're going. And some of them had misgivings to go. And I said, no, we have to go. And we went there and you had in the VIP section in both sides, you had maybe a thousand persons. And they found one seat for me and all the other members of parliament had to be stand up, had to stand up. They didn't, couldn't find a seat for them and they were invited as members of parliament for the Jubilee celebration at the Durban Park. So you're talking about dignity. Of course, after that happened, I told them let's leave because I wasn't going to stay here sitting down alone. And so we just left the place. So you talk, this guy is, 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 that's why I call them slime bags. Slime bags. Now he is, oh, he's so aggrieved, oh, we treated him badly because he had to come out the house. Now he, he should have, he's so shameless to talk that he had to leave the house the next day after Irfan Ali was sworn in after trying to steal the elections for five months. But forget the stealing of the elections that he was an active part of. You, this man knew, one, that he was no longer the prime ministerial candidate. So even if Apnu had won the elections, he's supposed to leave this, the prime minister's residence. He should have left there the day after the election because you're not the prime ministerial candidate. Even if Apnu wins, you shouldn't have been in there. So he squatted illegally five months there, squatted in that prime minister's residence. He had no right to be there, even, even if they had won the elections, because it would have been Ram Jatan who, would, who was the prime ministerial candidate who would have had to move in. He just hung on to the privilege there and make it look like, um, like he's been victimized. This is a man who just says these lofty things. He wants to, to bring people together. So let me see what Freddie Kisun had to say about, about him. So, he had one, I couldn't find the paragraph. Somewhere I read that Kisun said that he was critical of the Granger administration for being too ethnic in their orientation. But this, he and Ram Chetan were the biggest cheerleaders in parliament for the firing of the sugar workers. They were the biggest cheerleaders. In fact, people in APNU, not AFC, APNU had some of the leaders there had more integrity to a million times more than Nagamotu and, and, and Ramjatan. This was the guy who spoke of that they had lost the no confidence motion. And then it's sickening to hear his stupid explanation about 33 and 34. Matt is not his strong point too. But, but the thing is that it was so asinine. If you go back, I play it for you, I have it. I, I look at it recently. It's so in incoherent, doesn't make any sense. And to try to defend why 34 is a majority of 35. I don't know if he has that in his book or if he has about the Russians, I, the Russians still that were here. I already said Mercury helped us to steal the elections now in the U.S. government. I wonder if he told the U.S. government he was going to fight in Vietnam, the fiction about, about there. So, so the whole book, and he blames us about the stealing, from what I gather, about we wanted to steal the elections. Some, so I agree with Freddie Kisun. This is a comical book about a tragic man whose psyche is 
perhaps permanently damaged. It couldn't be better said. And he loved Jagan. They always find the love. And as Congress comes, they love Jagan even more. These are the people who try to destroy Jagan's party. These are the people who try to destroy. Imagine, and you try, Nagamutu will never say in Parliament when he was pressed, did the PNC rig the elections of the past? He changed the whole reality that we fought against for 28 years without admitting that the PNC stole the elections in the 28 years. And he likes to talk about the struggle for free and fair elections in those 28 years. He, he in a single swipe of extreme unmitigated opportunism, he ignored totally that history. This is, how could a person like that write anything that is believable and has credibility? This is the type of character that we, we're dealing with. So I suspect that many people, you know, when the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry report went to the, the parliament. This guy, who always been shouting, I'm a Rodneyite and all of that, said the people, he, he denied basically or ignored, he didn't want to conclude that it was the PNC who killed Walter Rodney. Imagine you go back and look at history. He used to be the one shouting this the most. So there's soul, there's souls, any residual principle, which wasn't much that he had, he and Ramjatan, for privileges. He loved the entourage of seven vehicles following the prime minister. That's what he missed when he left the office. Seven vehicles following the prime minister. Telling people this is a close, this is come to the top position, he always wanted it, etc. This is a pathetic, pathetic person who is trying to find a place in our history where he will be view, viewed with benign eyes. But people know his history, his sordid history, and they know his, his personality. And we must deny them. He, now, Nagamoto, anybody can make mistakes. But your road to salvation is not through a bunch of lies and fiction and make-believe uh, um, articles or a book. It's true confession. Confession and true acknowledgement that you were part of a cabal that had no, the interest, no interest in the people, the well-being of the people of this country. This is what we had to deal with. I'm not, I, I have lots of other things that I wanted to say, um, but, but I'm not going to deal with that um, today. The, um, the audits, last week I was asked about the audits. The full audits are up on the ministry's page, both, both audits. And we're now um, about to conclude the, the contract for the new audit. Thank you. Yes, go. mitigation now over the the gas to energy project uh, who are those two contractors and how does the money come up to 90 million US 
because which, the, which town? we're talking gas the energy now with the arbitration um the writers report had said there 90 no, million there is no it's claim not, of 90 million oh because how much is it then um i think it's it's 50 million but let me let me verify that but i don't see any claim of 90 million dollars but I don't care if they claim $500 billion. The, the, our engineering supervision firm has, um, has made it clear that they are not eligible for any additional payment. They rejected their request for additional payment. Seika? Huh? Which company is it? Yes, it's the two, the combined company that won it's the bid. Yes, oh, it's okay. a one contractor. Yes. yes, one contractor that we we have, right? Okay, so you get back to the exact. Yeah, I can figure. get the details of the exact claim for you, but okay. I, I don't. I doubt it's ninety million. But whatever it is, we have rejected that outright. We are set. We have said the three months extension, but no um, financial. And it's not in court. It's just. It's not in court. No, I explained the process through which we're we're, we're addressing it. Right I explained that. Okay. And you you have that, right? The process again. You want me to go back over it? Again? No, you oh, said you okay. said All it. Right. Yes. But I just wanted to you to make clear yes. that it's so not that, in court. No no, because it's going through that mechanism for us. That you said. Mm -hmm. That I, I, I said. And the company for GPL. Oh, it, I think it's car power, but maybe the Latin American are car power. It's a big, it's a huge company. And we had this offer before, um, where, but it was for a longer term duration. In the past, we had the offer. Where is car power based? Huh? Where is car power based? I, I think it's a Turkish company, but, um, but they have their major um, supplier of power around the world on, on ships, if you Google. I'm sorry, uh, on the same subject. Yes, go on, go on, give, give, give them, yes, give them. Uh, on this, check one. On the same subject, sir, could you say um, what will be the cost for hiring this barge for the estimated two years? Oh, okay. Um, so, so right now, I didn't want to. We, we haven't concluded the contract as yet, so it's going to be done. To, but but about part figure, there is a capacity charge, capacity and an ONM charge, and combined that's less than eight cents per kilowatt hour. But then we supply the fuel. So let me give you that. So. Less than eight cents per kilowatt hour with capacity in, of o &M. So they will supply the equipment, operate it, we supply the fuel. And that would be less than eight cents for the, the equipment and the o &M per kilowatt hour. What would be the total number of megawatts for the, for the bar? 36. 36. We're looking at 36. We are looking at a bigger vessel of 76 or 78, I think. But they, they can't connect. If we hook it up at Kingston, what will happen? The transmission main can't accommodate that, even the 36, because you'd leave all of our assets at Kingston stranded. So we wouldn't be able to produce there because the transmission main can only move the Kingston assets out, the Kingston power. So this is why we're looking at bringing it into the the Barbies River by Everton, and that way you will be able to dispatch the power. I have a couple of other questions, but uh, one last one. So, but but this is I just wanna um, I I have to be because we are now in the negotiation phase today. Hopefully by tomorrow we complete that. But most of the parameters are actually settled. We have we had to look at the river, the depth of the river. The connection to the existing grid that has been done, the fuel, the type of fuel, all of that has been done. The, the terms of the contract, which we seem to now have, have, have settled. So barring, barring no unforeseen circumstance, we should be able to wrap this up in a day or two. And it will take about maybe two to three weeks to, dip, 
to apply here. And how much money is Guyana looking forward to from UKEF for, to assist with the funding of some of the transmission and distribution works? Oh, well, UKEF has increased their allocation to Guyana for, for projects here to $2 billion. So it doesn't mean we are going to use the $2 billion. It's for several projects. So if we, um, if we use them for the transmission, a particular one, like we are looking at the transmission now to take the power to Linden, it will be in the magnitude of maybe $100, $150 million, depending on how far we take the power, how many power. Um, it's 100, it's 100 um, just over 100 kilometers of transmission main, but how many substations, how many feeders and stuff. So that, that's the range. Well, the, the documents have been sent up, the project profile already. But remember, that, that is just to take the power up the highway into Linden. But that is not dependent on the use of the 300 megawatts, because we can use all 300 megawatts even in the, dom the grid here. Not because we're not connected to Linden with this high power line. So that would also solve the question when we are bringing power down from a miler. If we do hydro, we'd be able to bring the power down through Linden down to the city again. So it's connecting that grid. Dr. Jagger, recently there's been some confusion. Um, just a short part of uh, former Prime Minister Sam Hines' letter, which suggested that GS Jagdeo was preparing us for a possible exit from office. And you know, some people are asking, it's 2015 at that time. Can you bring some clarity to that part of the letter? Yeah. That, um, a number of people have been asking me. And Sam has this way of being like honest. So I think, I wasn't general secretary at that time. I think he's ma mentioning me now. I was not G general secretary. Remember I had left office and I came back to assist with the 2015 elections. So I don't know how much I should speak about that. But I, I shared with the party in 2015, even before we approached the elections, my assessment of where we stood at that time, at the level of the executive. And many of my colleagues would know that it was not a, a favorable assessment of our chances to return to office. We had to do a lot more work. So I think Sam may have known about that. And he wrote this in his in the letter about Nagamotu. And then after the elections itself, we had a choice of saying that we lost the election, we, we didn't get the, the, um, the recount, and therefore we did not need to concede early. And even from the night of the elections, when I saw the numbers, etc., I said, we should have an early concession. So to accept and move on, because we had to rebuild and come back to power. So many people, I think that is what he meant when he said I was preparing the party and, well, others for, for exit, exit from office. So I, um, I don't want to get into more details of what took place in that period, because a lot of it is internal and about my views. But I think he was speaking more about that, my position at that time. Many people think publicly that I was saying, hang on, Apnu said, hang on, Jack, they wanted to stay on. He was scared and all of that nonsense. It wasn't so. I said, let's go. We're, we're going we're gonna to come back to office. We're not, we were not. 
um, uh, demoralized by yeah. Dr. Jagio, um, continually every week uh, you have your Thursday press conference and the initial intention was to bring clarity to Guyanese citizens for them to have a better understanding what's going on and ward off persons um, putting propaganda out there. But this um, press conference is, is with Kaicho News infusion is becoming more and more of a circus, which should be done at um, Durban, behind coffee dinner where the circus is. And you continue to facilitate it. At what time are we going to be dealing with the people's issues, like the teachers? Um, you know, strife is being set amongst the teachers. Um, no, well, ask me the question. Ask me. One thing, critic, is that you have a right to ask questions. So if you want to hear about the teachers, I will speak about the teachers. Just again, and, but my, I have a duty. We don't, we're not a country that's shut down media. We're not as outrageous as they are and as stupid as Glenn Lal could be. Uh, because if you listen to any of the things that he says, it doesn't make sense. Only, only a person who is bereft of any any, um, any common sense would believe what he says. It's so shallow, mediocre. But they continue with it, and I have a duty every week to the, to the people who support us, who may fall prey to this. They're hoping the unsuspecting would read a headline like that coming from Coretta, because there's a coordination between the opposition and Kaicho News, which took place in the past. 2015, it took place, and it led to our undoing because a lot of the lies left a lasting impression in many people, in, in our minds, that, yeah, there were, there were some truth to what they were saying, but there is no modicum of truth, and I have a duty here to expose it, as painful as it is to me and as tiring as it is to me. I will continue to do this every single week because we have a history of defending ourselves. So if you want to find out our position about teachers, ask me about it. And, but but let, I'm not going to stop the Kaicho News from coming here, nor am I going to stop them from asking questions. But Dr. Jagdu, the question is, is the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken? Because the last fuel that Kaicho News has is what you say. Nothing else is, is of importance all Kaicho depends on what you say. So if you were to stop talking to Kaicho for a week, I would suppose Kaicho would go to business. <laughs> so yeah, yes, to the teachers, um, okay. how, how, how is government dealing with that? Obviously, okay. behind the scenes, um, some confusion is trying to be created again yeah. amongst the teachers. How is government dealing with that? Okay, all right. So, so again, we see this the usual. We made it clear in the negotiations with the teachers, we, 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 first of all, we are waiting the court ruling. Our position is well known. We believe that if you don't work, you cannot receive pay. It's not just a belief in the PPP. This has been tested in our courts. There have been ruling in our courts locally and all the way to the Privy Council, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. So, no work, no pay, that principle has been established. Roy Stale Ford and the others are trying to say our constitution confers on Guyanese citizens and workers the right to receive pay even if they don't work. Now, if that's the case, we don't have a country anymore because you can choose not to work. All you have to do is to get your union to call a strike. And you can be on strike for 10 years and receive your full salary and not work. It's not common sense. Common sense. So that is what they're fighting in court. That's the first issue and and that will be ruled on in the court. The second issue is whether we should, we can deduct 
the fees from the members of the union and remit the same to the GTU. Now we have pointed out the state of affairs of the GTU in relation to financial accountability. Over an extended period, they have, the government has transferred, deducted and transferred over $2 billion to the GTU from teachers and they can't account for it until now. They have no audited statements, nothing of that sort. So, this matter was adjudicated already, and the Chief Justice at that time, Ian Chang, ruled that if the government, this is an executive decision, and if the government chooses not to, to deduct, it doesn't mean that the sums are not deductible, but the union has to make alternate arrangements. You recall Coretta McDonald acknowledged that, and she said, we will get our deductions collected through MMG. So that's the second case that we are waiting for a ruling on. That's the second ruling we're waiting on. Our argument, this is an executive de decision, and therefore the judiciary should can't tell the executive how to conduct its business, given the separation of powers. So the, the mediation that was <clears throat> imposed by the court led to a re-engagement between the two parties. <clears throat> and they made a proposal to go back to address wages and salaries issue to all the way to 2017 in the APNU period. So they want us now in 2024 to address wages and salaries issues from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. They expect us now to adjust the wages for that period. We said it's a non-starter. If we do that, we'd have to address for everyone in the country, including maybe the sugar workers who got zero in the whole APNU period, but we, not, we, we can't go back into the past. We said we are prepared to engage you in a multi-year agreement now, going forward, a three years agreement, make your proposals to the multi-year agreement going forward. <clears throat> Notwithstanding that, we have addressed several of their concerns. They have submitted about 41 issues. We did about 20 something of those issues. They don't, they don't see those as financial, but they couldn't even defend them in court because they have financial implications. They were arguing that these are not financial issues, and then had to concede in the witness box that they are financial matters that we've been address, addressing, addressing since 2010. I think we met with them more often than APNU did in the entire period. So I subscribe to the view that this is not driven by the best interests of teachers. Further, I, we've pointed out about the growth in education expenditure the increase in wages and salaries for teachers, especially at the upper end, the, the, the 6,000 people who were trained or are being trained now through the Gold Scholarship, teachers, our, as our commitment. And we said, it doesn't happen in the five years. It didn't happen any time in the past. This, many, this much help to the sector. So, so we believe that it's driven by Congress place. And this wouldn't stretch your imagination to see that there is a political motive to this because the head of the union is one of the most rabid members of the opposition. And the opposition, who is extremist, racist, and, and squatting on the general secretary position, or if you look at it the other way, squatting in the parliament, because our own rules prohibit her from being there in parliament as general secretary of the union. 
but she ignores all of this, and the media has already ignored it. The media has never gone after her and harassed her. Why aren't you, why aren't you resigning? Why are you in, in breach of your own re, you, 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 rules? You, you better believe it. If that was happening to a PPP member, the, every day there will, be, there will be calls and there will be the social media will be hung in them, etc. Nothing is happening here. So it's not a stretch of the imagination to believe that she would politicize the issue. It's not a stretch of imagination. She, re she made it real at the very beginning. You, you recall our statements that she could get a number of seats with these teachers' votes and all of that. So I wouldn't put it past them. And then the Lincoln Lewis joining in. You know Lincoln Lewis. He, He's a, a PPP hater and a, a person who was, as, I, I call them parasites, but um, he's lived off the workers for a very long time. I don't want to pay too much attention to Lincoln Lewis today. Yes. So that's Dr. John, do you finally, teachers, um, finally. I want to urge the teachers to, to work with us that we, we have we have major plans for the education sector. The remuneration will grow in the future. We have to be balanced, but in the future it will grow steeply, remuneration. And, um, and we have major plans for upgrading the education sector and the skills of our teachers. Dr. Dr. Jardio, finally, you have mentioned a few times um, uh, Nagamutu being useless. Um, the extent of uh, useless people... No, no, I didn't say that. I think that's the consensus in the country. Okay. Well, given that being the consensus, it seems that uh, Nagamutu is not the last useless person that the PPP has associated itself with. The PPP has become known for taking in people with open arms, um, and then you're finding out that they're useless. I'm wondering no, if... No, he was there a while. He became useless when he went to APNU. So it recently... Is, it is a... When you go in the collective in APNU, it stupefies you. I, I think in that leadership collective, I'm not speaking about APNU membership, I know. These are hard-working people who be, love the party too and stuff. I'm talking about that tiny cabal. And if you want to understand it, look at their display now. Look at the display of it now. Yeah, all you need to do is to see what's in the newspaper every day. And just look at one press conference with, with, um, with Roysdale Ford or with Norton or Amansa. And, and, and you, I, I rest my case. So this is, this is something, and th that's where he became useless. The question, Dr. Jagdio, is um, recently uh, there have been articles in the paper and on social media coming from uh, Anthony Vera, known as Tony Vera, a man who once um, you know, was great in this country, fell from grace. The PPP took him in with open arms. And just a month after coming out of a well-pampered PPP contract, he starts cussing the PPP out. Will you use this, conf, uh, this, this new Congress, the 32nd Congress, to start you know, showing people that when you come to the PPP, you have to have worked? Because Anthony Vare did not do anything for three years. That's the honest truth. Yeah. Is the government going to realize they make mistakes, the party make yeah. mistakes from time to time, and what you're planning to do to adjust for these useless people within the party? No, first of all, Vera is not a member of our party. That's the first issue. So he, he should be grateful to President Ali. I remember the last day when our list was being done, President Ali said to me, let's put, up, put this guy. He was lobbying, I think, President Ali to get on the list. And then I, I relented because we knew he was useless, but he was hanging around Freedom House. And, uh, uh, Oh, sometimes we are a little sympathetic, you know. There's a lot of empathy on our part, sometimes to even useless people. Sometimes, I, I must confess, there are times we have, 
we have accepted and, and it's because the party doesn't judge people too much. We try to bring people in the family. So in the family, you have party members, non-party members, former useless people, current useless people, all sorts of people. Once they, once they have one objective, and they subscribe to that, to work towards the upliftment of our country, we embrace people. Now, people may say it's naivety, but to get into the party, he doesn't have a party card. That's a whole different issue. And we never deny people who want to associate with us because we believe that everyone should have a fair, fair opportunity. You know, we have worked with a lot of people who, I remember in opposition, people who have had a hard time in life, went to prison and stuff. And they work with us, they reform. Some of these are the most progressive people now in, in this co country. They're making a life for themselves, totally reformed. So we're, we're like that. Now, Vera has not been known for, for, for um, major contribution to anything in this country. But as a citizen, I guess, if you want to associate with us, we don't, we don't deny people. The right to. No, 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 no. We, no, no, no. Not. We didn't try to get a Portuguese person. In fact, if you look at the concentration of Portuguese, we probably have all of them in the PBP, right? And most of them, a significant number of people. In fact, in fact, we just got criticized for that too. Nigel Hughes went to stood up, and he was at the Constitutional Reform Commission that the PBP promised wasn't a kangaroo commission like the one that he was appointed to under the Granger administration by Nagamutu that didn't do anything much. We said five from government, five from opposition, 10 from civil society, and you law, the Constitutional Reform Commission law, we passed it, we give terms of reference, we said you gotta go around the country. All of that promised by the PPP. He had no good word, to say, oh, the PP is keeping its promise. He goes there, he's a member of the commission, and then he says, oh, they don't have certain sets of people. There is no diversity on the commission. On that commission, APNU put together the four, the opposition put five men on the commission. Five men on the commission. We have our five, two women and three men. We, only one other civil society organization recommended a woman. I think the Bar Association or the female lawyers. So we had two women and three men. We had indo guyanese Portuguese, Amerindian, and afro guyanese on the commission. You're talking about diversity, and it did not, we didn't set out to do this. It's natural in the PVP. We didn't set out to do, oh, we're going to count who is here. It's just a natural thing for our party. And, and he talks about diversity. So this is, we don't need to do tokens uh, in the PPP. We don't do tokens. You come into the party, whether you're Portuguese or Indian or Amerindian or afro guyanese you got to work. You got to work in this party. You gotta, you, and you have a pathway to the future. Look at the, a lot of the leaders, now that you see them as ministers. Hamil, Joe Hamilton, PNC, um, Kwame, GGG, I think um, the, the Edge Hill and all of them, they're ministers in this government now working. They paid their dues 20 years of being in the party, got elected to the Central Committee. Kwame McCoy is a member of the Central Committee of the party. You pay your dues and you progress in this party. That's how it is. So, uh, and, and you know, the other parties is, is, uh, is not like that. We, because we value diversity. Clarity, Dr. Jadu, um, paying your dues, you mean putting effort into the party, not financial dues. No, 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 but you have to, they're token due to, you got to renew your card for 100 or 200 dollars a year, right, yeah, <laughs> if you have a party card, yes.
Um, good afternoon, Dr. Jack Dio, Trina Williams, Ghana Chronicle. I have two questions. This morning, we would have seen the opposition being bombarded with the question, with questions regarding their reasons. comment on this. And my second question is, um, we've seen that Venezuela in the counter memorial used false narratives from irresponsible Guyanese. Can you comment on this? Yes. Um, I am, I'm not Cathy Hughes, so I shall not, even when I don't agree with some of the issues that people in opposition make public to use that to undermine our sovereignty. I'm not Cathy Hughes. I'm not Cathy Hughes. These people have no, anyhow, let me, let me end it here. And hence, I, I qualify that low life comment. So I don't, I don't subscribe to low life behavior. So I'm not gonna run down any member of the AFC or APNO because Venezuela has sought to distort what they've said here. And whether that, what they said was wisely said or not, that's a different matter. We are clear on one thing. Our Venezuela has no case whatsoever. Um, it cannot produce a shred of evidence to show that the 1899 award is flawed. And that's the issue before the ICJ. So although I have strong views that I'll keep in my heart, and sometimes in private moments, I'll, I'd vent on what was said, but I will not do it publicly. The second thing is that I don't want to get into commenting on the internal affairs of the, the PNC. They have their own worry to, to sort out. Um, but as I said before, people who, it was the same Holder. He was there today. I don't pay too much attention to, the, to those who are going to these press conferences, but the same holder was the one after Norton said that they were contesting in almost all of the constituencies in the country, in local government. We found out that they were not contesting in nearly half of the two constituencies in the whole country, and he said almost all. How can you be even credible? That is his history, and so, so I don't, this is how much support that they were gaining, but they couldn't even contest in local government elections in more than half, well, nearly half of the, the constituencies in Guyana. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, Kim Alking, Oil Now. Could we come back to talking a bit about the gas energy project? Specifically, you said that the government believes that for the single cycle gas turbines, yeah. three months delay to March, April is reasonable, but the contractor wanted a delay to August. Um, do you see, for, for whatever reason, the contractor No, but I don't wanted. want, I'm giving the facts. I don't want to hear speculate about discussions and the arbitration. I just gave you the facts, what happened, why the three months delay, because the site was handed over three months later. We believe that's reasonable. I don't want to speculate um, and say something here that they may use in the arbitration. Okay, I had just wanted to get an understanding of the certainty of 
the three months delay? Because I think what people want no, to know but, is if there's but, a delay. But that is our position now. That's our position now. But if you know, if, if you um, listen carefully to what I said, that the outer end of the project has not shifted, that is 300 megawatts by the end 2025. But there was an intermediate um, target, which is the symbol cycle, the, the gas turbines coming on stream earlier than the steam turbines. Okay, no problem. And just to confirm from your explanation just now, you expect that when these projects are completed, Linden will be connected to the main grid from 2020. So, so we are working on that too, but that is not, that could happen after because we can utilize all of the power by dispatching them to, to the West Coast and for the rest of the country for where we're supplying. Because right now, Linden is being supplied from the Bosai arrangement. It's not part of the interconnected grid. We are buying power right now, right now to supply there. So we are also putting in, in Linden about 15 megawatts of solar. So that will help in Linden. And that's gonna go soon. We are gone out to tender for that. So that will happen in the next year or so. So we can supply Linden with another 15 megawatts of solar. The idea though is to connect all of this. So I don't, it is, the priority right now is gas, the pipeline, the gas, the energy power, the power plant, the NGL facility, the transmission main, and the control center. And then the upgrade of the, the grid the distribution system. But simultaneously, we're working to connect London too. But if that gets connected a little bit later, it will not change the situation in London. They're already getting cheaper power and they're getting a fairly reliable supply. And then with our putting in 15 megawatts of, of solar, they would, uh, that would secure London too. But we want to connect them because then that would allow us to take more power also to the highway which is booming now, it would develop in a major way. Okay, thank you. Are you able to provide any insight on what is gonna come out of the recent Security Council meeting on the controversy because they haven't put out a... No, 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 that, that is entirely for the Security Council. That would be speculation on my part. Your government. Yes, so. but governments also have to learn to shut up sometimes. Sometimes government talks a lot because this is the Security Council. You know what we, what is before the Security Council is this so-called organic law, which seeks to annex our a significant part of our territory and incorporate it into the state of Venezuela. And and that is before the Security Council. So we we will condemn this, of course and we would point out that this is a violation of the Argyle Agreement and also of the provisional measures of the ICJ. And the, the Security Council, since the ICJ is one of the arms of the United Nations, the Security Council should ensure compliance with the, the provisional measures of the ICJ, should take a strong position. That's our position before the Security Council. You are asking me to say what the other parties will say. I can't, I don't want to speculate about that. Okay, now that Venezuela has submitted its counter memorial to the ICJ, I'm trying to get an understanding from the government's um, perspective. How far out do you see there being a substantive ruling on the case? So, the timeline we were given is maybe by originally with Venezuela fully participating in the process. Could, could be end next year. That's the outer timeline. 
but this is dependent entirely on the ICJ. So let me make that clear at the beginning. But that's the timeline given the, the time for memorials and counter memorials and the hearing, etc. That was considered a reasonable timeline. That timeline could be shortened or it could probably be acted out in full depending on how engaged Venezuela is. So we've seen them submit a counter memorial. However, they still maintain that the ICJ doesn't have jurisdiction on which, because that's what their law, they, the referendum asked. Um, and the ICJ itself has already ruled that it has jurisdiction. So we welcome it because we believe they should participate there, but we believe they don't have any evidence. And they will, that is why the memorial is going to focus and has focused on a series of extraneous issues that are not germane to the core issue before the court, which is the, the 1899 award, the validity. And they have to prove now, which is an appeal to us that the, the award is not valid. Okay, and that timeline that you just gave, is that um, something that was estimated prior to the delay that was occasioned by the preliminary objections that Venezuela had raised? Yeah, this, this is a timeline that we believe is an entire current, current, it's a timeline that is current. Okay, thank you. Hi, VP Shaquan Gill, um, DPI. I had two questions. I just for but, uh, Let me make a point. This is our internal estimate. We can determine the ICJ timeline itself, you know. Shaquan Gill, DPI. Um, for clarity's sake, right, the bringing on of the 228 megawatts and that having a three month delay, this will not affect the end of year 2025 of everything coming no, on. No, no. That, yeah. that is part of the contract that a project must be completed by end 2025 with the 300 megawatts. So there is no delay in that. It is this, this part where the gas turbines have to come on earlier than the steam turbines. VP, writers had projected that it would be a four-week pause in production. Um, you're saying two weeks yes, pause that, in production. that is what Exxon has said uh, to us. Are you, and is government satisfied that this two-week pause in production does not outweigh the overall benefits of the gas energy project when it's completed? Yeah, you don't have this from the beginning. That's why I said this is not rocket science anymore. If you're building a pipeline, from the first day you start, you know you have to connect. So now, now it comes, as, comes up as an issue. But for me, right from the beginning, we knew that at some stage, you have to pause production to connect. So sometimes people make these uh, Suddenly, this is a revelation. This is a new revelation, and the country gets all excited about it. But that is, if you think it through, and at the beginning, if you work through it yourself, you have to know it's commonsensical. So that's what I'm concerned about. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Jaglio. Yes. Rihanna Ramsey, Kaichur News. I have three questions. Um, the first is, I want to know, uh, when will the government, when will the gas to energy agreements be tabled in the National Assembly? Mm -hmm. And has the government been able to persuade Exxon to accept the U.S. 240 million audit findings? And if not, has a final decision been made by the government regarding arbitration? I, I made it clear at the beginning that we can't reach agreement, so there is a move to the next stage on the first audit. We will not reach agreement with Exxon, so we have to now go 
to the next stage provided for, but which is uh, by the agreement, which could be some form of a single individual. If you don't reach agreement there, then you go to full arbitration. So, so I've explained that already. There is way too far apart to reach agreement there. So we have to trigger that. That's the that's the first first thing. And now you have the full agreement. So you can't complain it's hiding anymore and all of that. It's before you. You have the full, I, I, last week you asked and I got them to put both um, the audits, put both up on, on the website, the ministry website. And what's the first question? When will the gas to energy agreement? Oh, okay. I, 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 maybe, maybe soon. I don't know. I don't know. That's, um, for Gail to share and the others to develop. But we have tabled a lot of things. We're gonna table, we, we, it's almost everything that you see in the agreement, you know, you know. So I don't, I, we told you the price, $759 million, that's the price. We told you the, um, the timeline for implementation. You know how many turbines and what's the size of the turbine. Almost every component of the agreement, you know what the liquidating damages are. We're gonna get the same situation. You, do you know how many agreements we table routinely? And nothing comes out of them. It's the same gaff the opposition has. When you don't have anything to say, you just say, oh, we don't have enough information. This is a lazy set of people, lazy. Oh, we don't have enough information. They didn't have enough information on ring fencing. They don't have enough informa information on contracts that they sign. It's lazy. And so we are not gonna be, you recall Ramatar tabling all the agreements relating to Amila? Every, a big set of documents showing the environmental studies, the, the feasibility study, the design study, everything, and what came out of it. They didn't read a single bit of it. You get from Patterson now that the power would have cost 30 cents per kilowatt hour. When I show that it's mathematically impossible because you're gonna have uh, 1,300 gigawatt hours and multiply by 30 cents per kilowatt hour, that's 400 and something million US dollars per annum. When to pay the contract, the, the supply of power, when our cap was $100 million. I pointed this out. Anybody doing simple mathematics can do that. But he lies about it and it gets prominence and gets reflected in the newspapers. I'm done with helping this opposition. And, and, and some of the people who, you have, to, you have to sort these things out yourself. So it, it will be like anything else. Can you state what actions or decisions your government has taken in relation to the findings, in relation to the findings of both oil audit reports? That's the last question. What the audit, what the audit report again? All right. Which? Oil audits were taken by the government regarding the findings. There is only one action you can take. I told you already, it's the technical staff either agree or disagree with the finding, the technical staff. How many times do I have to explain this? Yes, yes, oh yes, on the second audit. Yes, 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 if that, but. Yes, yes. No, they did not they did not say that. We have indicated to them that we can't reach agreement, so we have to now move to this. But the second one we have identified already. And thank you for explaining this now. So that the second one we have the findings they were written to by the technical agencies, not by the politicians to give comments on their findings. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Jagish Shervin, Kaichur News. 
Um, last October marked 30 years since you first became a minister. Uh, then you became the country's longest serving executive president. Now that you're vice president, what are some of the things that you're most proud of over the past three decades of your career? And what do you regret the most? I regret saying that we need more people like Glenn Lamb. You remember one time when, um, when I was, Sabbath News had a monopoly and we, I was encouraging a free media and all of that. And then I said in a speech when the launch of the Kaichun, you remember that Dennis, you're, you're smiling. And I said, we need more people. The, I think God punished me for it. Yeah. <laughs> for saying that, right? So, so achievements. Um, I've seen, and this could take a long time, but let me go through quickly. I recall in 92, where we were. We were a bankrupt country. Totally bankrupt. So, by the time, even before oil, the PPP, we restored the country to financial viability. Now, that is not a small feat. When you take a country that was using over 100% of its revenue to service debt. And to get that down to under 10% 10, 10 of revenue to service debt. And in the intervening period, still get 100,000 house lots out, 30,000 new homes built, in the water wars that we had with people pulling these ray cards with water, and practically in the water wars, and show that by that time we had one of the fastest growing economy before oil in the region. At that team, the macro economy had single digit inflations for inflation for a number of years. Ensure that the mortgage rates come down all this period. I can chronicle a million things. In spite of objections from negative people, still got the Marriott built, the, the stadium built, the Hope Canal built, the Barbies Bridge built, without money too, without, now, now it's easier. And that time, even to put together a project like the Barbies Bridge was $40 million. We had to do it through a public-private partnership and be creative. Now we can afford that. We are affording a 261 million bridge, a four lane bridge. Tough, tough years, very different. And all the time with street protests, you recall from 92, before I took over, Janet Jagan had to deal with it. Apnu trying to pull down more fire, slow fire, more fire um, on the street, burning properties. The moment I took over, from, it took me several years to settle the country. I took over when you had massive street protests because Apnu was claiming the elections were rigged fakely. And throughout all of that, then the crime wave that you're gonna see the commission of inquiry on now was a politically instigated crime wave designed to, to cripple the PPP. It was an insurgency. So we had the negatives coming from some of these NGOs, from the opposition, but not the kind of passive kind of opposition now. Actively taken to the streets, burning buildings, um, with the, using crime as a political tool. That's the context that we had to fight. And we struggled through it all. We, and the border issue, we got the first border, maritime boundary settled for ages because we hadn't settled borders since maybe eons. So I can go down the list and someday maybe I should do it um, because I see a big attempt to rewrite history now. Like uh, you see the Nagamotu now. He has been fighting for uniting people, bringing people together. When he was, he was big, one of the biggest polarizing influences in this country. And we, we have done 
So, so I'd love to answer you fully what in the years that we have done, in very difficult circumstances, to get the country to this state. Now, it's a, it was a rough, long road. And I'm surprised it's coming from Kaichou News because you know the odds against we did it. What, in the early period, I, I, you talk about blackouts. It's two weeks without power at a time when I re returned to Ghana. Two weeks at a time. You don't have power at all in two weeks. And, and the, it, the city was, and anyhow, we had to craft a program, repay the debts, get debt right off. I, I personally led that the debt right off is over $2 billion of debt we got written off. And then we repaid over a billion dollars more. Today, our debt in US dollars, external debt, is lower than the debt we had in 1990 when our economy was the size of the, uh, just about $300 million. Our per capita GDP was similar to Haiti. So you, it's a long, long, tough period for us. And so it's easier policy making in this environment today is a much, much easier. Um, and so the things to be seriously, maybe the things I, I regret to be serious about that is that we didn't more robustly tackle this racism. We allowed the lies to, to, um, to infect people and large numbers of people. We didn't go to the communities uh, in a way that designed to, to tackle the whisper campaign. It was tough to. Um, so like us killing 400 young African men for years. That was the APNU, APNU propaganda against us. A total lie. Can't prove anything, but it became, became a big rallying call for them. And, and the lies by our corruption, we didn't tackle it, so we said, forget it. If we're building the Marriott, we're building it. Imagine at that time, when you were building the Marriott, the, the mayor at that time said, He's opposed to the Marriott Hamilton Green because they own the land. Is it reminiscent of something today in 2024? The same, same the mayor, same up new mayor now, doesn't want this one built because they own the land, which is false. You go back and look at the history of these things. The Barbies Bridge, we had to fight tooth and nail to get that done. Just imagine Guyana without that bridge or they open up. I saw the 2016 article. Soon as APNU got into office 2015, 2016, oh, the Hope Canal, they cut the ribbon, Hope Canal is flourishing now. But the GHRA, the Guyana Association of Professional Engineers, were all opposed to the, the, the Hope Canal. They said it will never work. The design is bad. The human rights body in Guyana said, you should never have that. There are a ton of people opposed it. Just imagine if we didn't build that. We had to persevere against the APNU and then so-called civil society. And the same faces are still here creating the trouble now. So you're asking me about the progress in, in over the period what, I, what I've seen. It's, it's a tough, thing to look at Ghana, in, a new, in fact, a newspaper. You think, like what the article that Kaicho News did on the pl airplane, you think a New York Times in a, would ever publish an article like that? Or any newspaper, self-respecting newspaper anywhere in the world? Nobody would, they would stop buying the paper immediately. So to make, such, make up such a a, a big lie and tell it there on the front page and keep persisting with these lies. You, it, you think that would happen anywhere in the world? But it happens here. And just imagine every day as policymakers, you have to fight for development and then still fight off the lies. 
that they tell about 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 us. So, so stuff. Yes. Yes. Sure. yes. Um, I've heard figures to have the cost of the project. Will the government have to subsidize the cost of electricity to diabetes to ensure it will achieve their objective? Dennis, I went through this, but let me go through it once again. Right now, the cost of generation is 20, about 20 something cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so if our cost is four, just over four cents maybe maximum, the answer is, and we're selling at 11, we're gonna, we're gonna cut that, that down to about 11 to cents or so. So we don't have to subsidize. Then, the cost could even be lower because we now, that excludes the liquids that we get. So when we sell the cooking gas, which is about four times what the country is now using, that money comes to government because we own it too. We own the liquid. When they, they, they send the dry gas to generate the power, the liquids are ex extracted, and we own that too. We, if we sell that, we believe that the sale of that can almost pay back for the whole project itself. So that means your cost of power generation is really could be zero. Because if you're paying back from, a rev you're getting a revenue from here, from the sale of the liquid alone, not from the sale of power, and that revenue can pay back for the pipeline, the NGL facility and the power plant and own them, then practically you're getting it free. So that's why we're saying it's a no-brainer. We, we don't want, and, and, and I don't understand why people can't see this. You, 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 you got the point. Yes, sir, um, on the one of the terms of the improvements of the foreign healthcare, yeah, take, take. Foreign healthcare workers is that they should not participate in any industrial action um, during their term of employment, um, they should not also arrange or participate in no, industrial but, action. But, but there are, Do you agree with this? No, but in the country age old, there is something called the Essential Services Act. So Essential Services Act prohibits in most countries a part of sectors from striking. This didn't happen with the PPP. We didn't invent that globally. That's part of the, the laws, the body of laws of most countries in the world, including in the UK, the United States, etc. So that's why when the air traffic controllers struck in the US, the government could intervene directly. Then the powers of the minister under the labor law, not under the PBP alone, it is the labor law gives the minister the right to impose arbitration on, on some of the, if you have strike. So we're now reinventing this. This is part of the body of law that has been there, you know, for a very, very long time, even before the colonial era. Right, but um, you've also had instances under your administration as well, where the public service union had called out the nurses on strike. And I think there were, there were some aspects of the law that were used by the union to have those workers in strike and they were not penalized. So I think there is no, also, no, no, but, there is also but, leverage that they could use. Yeah, yes, but I don't want to get into the detail. I'm just speaking about essential services. So that's the reason for the clause? Essential services are considered, um, there are some sectors that are con fall under the Essential Services right. Act and those would be applied. Outside of that, people should have the right to strike. And if you're not part of the essential services, and there is such a clause in your recruitment, then you can easily challenge it in court because that would deny you the freedom to strike in our enshrined in our constitution. So the freedom to strike is enshrined in our constitution, except in those cases which are accepted under the Essential Services Act. Right. So you can easily challenge it if there is such a clause that, that runs against, you know, you're not part of essential services. 
Okay, um, Dr. Jagdeep. My second question is, um, sir, we have seen Mr. Fay, former leader of the opposition from Senegal, fulfilling his promise to his nation to renegotiate oil and gas contracts. Last week, as soon as he took office as president, uh, he announced audits and probes into these contracts. What about you, sir, who promised the same thing as opposition leader? How much, how much is Senegal producing in oil and gas? How much? You don't know? Oh, you are asking me a question and you don't know. Huh? Yes. So, so you don't know the basics of it. You, have you heard my arguments before? And the arguments still hold true. I've outlined in great detail why we would remain credible. We're not blowing about in the wind like the Apno. We remain credible because the only way you can in the long term change this country or medium long term is and make all of our people prosperous is if you stick with the task of nation building. Not every week change your mind. Nobody will want to work with you or invest here. And that seems to be a feature of the, the newspapers and the opposition now. So I've outlined this already. I've outlined the reasons why. And so I'm not going to repeat those. Um, and I also, you said to me once that um, Norton wanted to, Norton was willing to offer expertise on renegotiations. So I asked you to, to outline to him a few of the things. And I said, if he addresses these issues, fine. I, I, you recall that, right? So I dealt with that issue extensively in the past. I'm dealing with it again today. Okay, uh, my final question, yes. um, Dr. Jagger, government decision not to cap interest rates uh, on oh, X on cap investment. cap interest rates. I dealt with that 150,000 times before. Um, move on. Yes. Final Thank question you. is that... Oh, that's it. The final, final. That was yeah, the final, point. final question. Okay, all right. My final question is that some folks are alleging that you might be one of the beneficial owners in the Kaichur and Kanji block. Can you deny or confirm? I'm not a beneficial owner in the Kaichur and Kanji block, but you see, this is what. So they asked me a question that's totally outrageous, and then tomorrow's headline would say, Jagdeo denies being an owner in the Kaichur and Kanji block. That is precisely why he's asking me, so then they can put that headline. I, I heard Glenn Lal is the owner. Is that so? And you have some shares too? So you should put, when you put that, say Jack, they question whether Glenn Lal and the reporter own some shares in the, in the Kaichur and Kanji block. Any, yeah, you would like to get some shares there? Well, all right, so maybe, but you ha do you have any? Oh, okay. And so you, please put in the article too that Jack, they will ask the reporter whether he has shares too, or Glenn Lal has shares in this. This is, this is precisely um, what, what they do. So you get that planted and then could put the headline tomorrow. Glenn Lal asks him. I know, I know what's gonna happen, predictable. Thank you. All right. Yeah.